Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Monica Ortiz Uribe. Our southern ports of entry, the bridges and the land crossings we use to travel between the U.S. and Mexico every day are usually heavily congested. Every day there are thousands of commercial and passenger vehicles that wait in line. So what sort of an effect does that have on air quality in the border? And what sort of health effects does it have on the people breathing that air in? My guest today has looked at, into some of those questions in his research. His name is Hector Olvera, and he is the Director of Research at the School of Nursing at the University of Texas at El Paso. Welcome, Hector. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so tell us about, I understand you've been doing this research for a number of years, and it's been uh, evolving, but you started off looking at the ports of entry. Tell us uh, how you got interested and what you found. Well, uh, I'm a native of uh, Ciudad Juarez. Uh, I graduated over there and I went to Utah for my graduate studies. So, but I lived over there, so I became a daily commuter. So I was crossing the bridge every day. And as an environmental engineering student back then, uh, and with specifically a focus in air pollution, it was just a matter of time where I started asking questions about I mean, how harmful are, are these exposures during when you're crossing and things like that. And so what did you discover when you started to look into it? Well, several things. Uh, the thing that I became more interested in, there's a very different set of pollutants. You have particles, you have different types of gases, and, and most of them have been studied for decades now. But something that uh, only the last 15 years we've been focusing on are nano-sized particles. These are very small particles, even some of them smaller than viruses. And most of them are emitted by heavy-duty diesel traffic, commercial vehicles, the ones that cross, you know, the big trucks. Uh, and when I was crossing the Bridge of the Americas, which is the one I use the most, I noticed that there was a lot of vehicle traffic, the, the private commuters, but there was also a lot of commercial traffic. And I knew that commercial vehicles emitted more of these little nanoparticles. So that was sort of the focus of the study. And what I noticed there is that, first of all, they're very predictable, uh, the levels. Uh, they are relatively high, uh, but not as high as values that had been uh, reported, for instance, for interstates in California or in New York. So it wasn't as high as I thought it was gonna be, but still relatively high. <clears throat> and when I say high, people, usually ask me, uh, is that harmful? And sadly, we don't know yet. Uh, the U.S. does not have a <clears throat> an air quality standard for these little particles. Uh, but the values are relatively low compared to interstates in other cities, mm -hmm. uh, but higher than other areas within the region. So they are higher at the bridge, but not higher than what have we have seen in other places. And then there's a difference, right? There m <coughs> maybe the pollution is heavier at an interstate, but you people don't typically linger at an I at an interstate the way they do on a on a bridge where you could be not moving and just taking in the air either with your windows down or through the air conditioning. Is there a difference in the health effect despite the the levels? The so you bring up a very interesting question. So the question is to whom would these particles be harmful? Yeah. Uh, well, if you commute, if you cross a bridge every other day or once a week or whatever, it might not be too much. But if you are a, a person crossing every day, and even more so if you're a person working near the bridge, yes. so for instance, if you're an immigration officer, if you're a customs officer, or if you're one of those people that uh, use the bridge to sell, for instance, things, then they're exposed every day for 12-hour shifts. So we don't know. I don't think there's a study done in that population, but definitely, from what I understand, it would be a very good idea to understand the health effects on people that are exposed on a daily basis to this. So is that your goal in, in your research? Is that something that you're still looking into, or have you... Uh, well, yes and no. 
so the, the second question when, uh, well, the first question that came up when I noticed that the values at interstates at other cities were higher, I wonder what were the values near our interstate here, interstate 10, 10 and specifically. And effectively, I, I, after the bridge study, I published another study uh, modeling and measuring uh, ultrafine particle gradients or, or the levels around interstate 10. And effectively, they were higher than at the bridge. Uh, something good about uh, the way that highways are structured in Texas specifically is that most of the highways have these gateways, have these streets that are parallel. So very few people live near interstates. Uh, but those people that do live near interstates uh, and elsewhere, not only here in Texas or New Mexico, but other cities, uh, they are exposed to high levels and sometimes higher levels than at the bridge crossing. And here you have people that either leave or work or even go to school at locations that are very near highways and they would be at a higher risk than the average citizen or even sometimes people that cross the bridge. So now, is that what your where your research is taking you? Is that where you're uh, focused on? Is yes. So my research evolved from the bridge to near highway exposures. Uh, again, now you have people not only that are exposed accidentally uh, or once in a while, but people that are exposed on a daily basis, right? Either at a, at a school or a workplace or at home. Uh, something that immediately popped up when you start looking at near highway air pollution exposures is that you notice that it's the most, the lower socioeconomic communities that tend to be exposed to these levels. Uh, the, the value of uh, land around interstates in most places is very low. So you see low SES communities there, and, and you have now a, what I think it's, is the accumulation of exposures because you have everything that comes with being poor on top of being exposed to air pollution. So it was at that intersection that my research really took off. And this is a, this is a scenario that doesn't only play out on, in the border. It plays, it, you could ar make an argument that it plays out nationwide. Um, is <coughs> Definitely. So across the U.S. there are several studies that show this. It, it's, it's, it's well documented mm -hmm. that low SES communities tend to be exposed to the higher levels of air pollution, specifically mm -hmm. traffic air pollution. And there's some literature that documents a similar phenomenon in other countries, specifically developed countries. So this is a phenomenon. And then of course in uh, developing countries, well, there the pollution is more homogeneous, but again you have communities from low SES countries being exposed to higher levels as well. So, um, so w where, where, are you, where are you going with the research? How are you going about studying and what are you trying to determine? So a couple of things happened when I was at this sort of intersection in my career. So, so the first thing I noticed is that studying air pollution by itself in this area was not going to be enough. Every time I, I was thinking about a study, I, I was thinking, well, I'm going to need to account for all these other things. And, and poverty implies many things. And there's this sort of social uh, stress set of stressors that I would have to account. Now, I was trained as an engineer. Uh, and here I am wondering about uh, what the social psychological factors uh, play an, a role in, in exposures to air pollution. Uh, so the, my first big challenge was, and uh, again, I'm very passionate about this question, but the first question is, well, I need to go back and get retrained. Uh, so I spent the last eight years slowly investing a lot of time and effort uh, in developing that set of skills. And uh, what, what set of skills are you referring to? Well, I need to understand about psychology. I need to understand about stress. I need to understand about uh, childhood adversity. Of course, I needed to understand a lot more about the biological mechanisms that link uh, social stress with air pollution. So it was a lot of biology, a lot of health science as well. So you're, you're trying to look at it at the where uh, poverty and health intersect. And, and the environment. And the environment. Yes. OK, OK. So I was very fortunate. So here I'm at this crossroads where I, I suddenly realized that to pursue the question that I'm now very passionate about, and I need all these new skills um, by luck, I guess, mm -hmm. um, uh, the School of Public Health at Harvard 
uh, started a new fellowship program uh, where they were looking specifically for junior faculty that were interested in the intersection of social and environmental factors. So, and this, again, this is just by luck. <laughs> by luck uh, you came across and, it. And I was nominated by the university, I, which I gather a lot of support from. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more than 70 uh, applicants uh, responded to the request for the first cohort. Yes. Uh, I was lucky enough to be among the 21 that were interviewed and the nine that were selected for the fellowship. So out of 70, those those candidates were, uh, out of nine were chosen out of the 70. Nine were, nine were selected. And, and you, well, congratulations. Thank you. How, how has that been then, that, this Life changing, life changing. Uh, again, I don't think that I would be studying this very important problem at this point in time without the help of the fellowship. Uh, the fellowship came with support for research. Mm -hmm. uh, they embraced the questions that I am sharing with you. Yes. Uh, but not only that, it came with mentorship. Uh, I have five mentors, three from Harvard, the directors, and two that I was able to select. So I have an environmental toxicologist from uh, University of New Mexico as a mentor. I have a psychologist whose expertise is in measuring stress and chronic stress from UCLA, plus experts in neuroscience, psychology, and environmental health from Harvard. So they're helping me develop the skills that I need in terms of psychology measurement and uh, uh, toxicology to go after the questions that I'm interested in now. So I want to hear more about mm -hmm. the fellowship, but before that, I'd like I'm curious for you to tell us what you found so far in the research, uh, the, this new phase of research that that you've done. So so far, what I did was I went back and started to review the literature. There's very li very few published studies on this subject. But there is a lot of research on, for instance, childhood adversity uh, and how that affects health. There's studies by the CDC that show, for instance, that as your exposure to adversity when you're a child, and this could be uh, family violence or crime around your neighborhood, as you're exposed to more of those events, your odds of developing depression, cardiovascular health, um, uh, cancer, diabetes increases. Uh, the, the biological mechanisms or the, or, or the behavioral mechanisms are still unknown, but research shows that, th this link. There's also research that shows that uh, adversity or stress early in life uh, changes the way our body, our immune system responds to a wide range of stressors, like stress, food, uh, virus or bacterial infections uh, and I suspect when I started to connect all of these dots that um, childhood adversity stress early in life might also be making us more susceptible to air pollution. Ah, so you know when as you were explaining this I wondered well does it change um, uh, does it change you in a, in a way that makes you stronger against adversity or does it change you in a way that makes you weaker? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, definitely, and there's research that shows or strongly supports this, there are um, factors of adversity that do make you stronger, that do make you more resilient. Like your, your immune system works. Well, or, no, maybe, or maybe psychologically, to. maybe in terms of behaviors. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe even your immune system means some exposure to some uh, bacteria early in life uh, does strengthen your immune system. Uh, so so there's, there's that. But uh, there's also mounting evidence that suggests that if you're exposed to too much stress when you're young, your immune system tunes itself to this adverse environment and you tend to react more aggressively uh, to things that stimulate your immune system. Mm -hmm. So for instance, psychological stress uh, triggers an immune response. But if you were exposed to childhood adversity when you were, li you were little, you respond more aggressively. What that means is that you generate more inflammation than you would normally do. And 
if you repeat that a lot, if you're exposed to a lot of stress over time, I suspect that you accelerate the development of a lot of chronic illnesses that affect the U.S. population today. Oh, and so are you seeing this? Are you at a point where you're seeing this, um, uh, this sort of a reaction when it comes to being exposed to poor environmental conditions, poor air quality, these neighborhoods by the interstate that... Uh, so, so you're going to have to invite me back. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sad because I'm... we have to have a part two. Because I'm going I'm, to... So this is where I'm at. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put all of those, those dots together and I developed two protocols to, to study this. The first one is to gather more evidence to strongly suggest that this hypothesis makes sense. So I, I wanted to put all of those dots that I just mentioned in one study because what I did is that I gather evidence from a whole different set of fields of study. So I, deci I designed one of the first studies to put all of them into one and we're about to launch that early next year. Okay. Uh, we're gonna study how childhood adversity uh, might change the way your immune system responds to air pollution, and we're gonna measure that. Uh, the other thing is that I forgot to mention and how this links back to my original research is that childhood adversity, uh, uh, it's more common or we're exposed to more of it uh, if we come from low socioeconomic communities. Mm -hmm. So this is where everything sort of comes back and gets linked together. Yeah. If you are a child in a low SES community, you're there more are many on the border along you're the more likely to be exposed to shower adversity. Mm -hmm. And if what we suspect is true, then you're more likely to be susceptible to air pollution, which by the way also increases in terms of exposure in low SES communities. You're also probably more susceptible to stress, meaning even when you're an adult, mm -hmm. and you're more susceptible to some kinds of foods. All of these factors are also more uh, deteriorated in low SES communities. So it's just one over another over another set of susceptibilities, all of them compounded in poor communities. So, and I, I think this has been uh, researched pretty thoroughly, you know, the, this relation between uh, living in a low socioeconomic scenario and having to deal with uh, poor health conditions and poor environmental conditions. I mean, that's pretty well documented, uh, correct? Yes. Uh, in terms of, for instance, epidemiological research. So what, what I wonder is, what, what are you looking at that, that, goes beyond, that tells us more, um, that tells us beyond? Great um, question. So first, there's, although we have done a lot of this research in pieces, uh, there's very little interdisciplinary research, meaning research where we look at everything together. And there's a reason for that. It's complicated. Yeah. I mean, for science, it's, it's, it's the easiest, the most practical way to do research is to isolate and control for a lot. Mm -hmm. The thing with this problem that we're facing is that every time we control for something, we actually eliminate that from our study. So we know how poverty affects one thing. We know how air pollution affects other things, but we don't know how everything when put together affects awesome. us. So that's what the, f the first thing that it's new, that it's really an interdisciplinary question from design. It's putting everything together. The other thing is, and this is the most interesting but also frightening part of this, is that some of the evidence suggests that this is an epigenetic process. What that means is that these events during our childhood turn on or off certain set of genes that makes us more susceptible to many things. The problem with this is that, let's say you're a person that when you were a child you were poor and exposed to adversity, but you were resilient, you went to college or you started a business, now you're doing better, mm -hmm. you grew yourself out of poverty, you educated yourself, a lot of the behavioral risk factors, they're not gone. However, because the effect is also in your genes, there's a possibility you're gonna inherit this to your kids, this susceptibility. So them, although they're not ch children that were exposed to either adversity or poverty, they still inherit the susceptibility. This is the next generation. So you're seeing changes, in, what you're saying is you're seeing changes in, in people's genes as a result of being in these situations where they're Yes, there's, well, 
let me go back. There, there's evidence that this is happening. So the, the one thing right now in terms of this research is that it's at, at an early stage. Uh, but there's enough evidence for us to suspect that this is happening. And this takes me to answering your previous question, which is why is this necessary and why is, why, how is this new? Well, this research uh, that we're starting among other researchers around the country, it's to really start looking if these epigenetic processes are really there, and more importantly, to identify which genes are the ones that are, are get turned on and off. The evidence that we have right now comes mostly from animal models, so studies with ri uh, rats and mice, and mm -hmm. that those studies do show these epigenetic changes. Now what we're doing at this stage is moving forward and starting to look at these studies with human subjects. So these are changes in people's genes as a result of the environment that they live in, as a, as a, as, as a result of environmental stresses that they live with. Exactly, you're seeing with. exactly. And so you say you're now, you're, you're looking at, at this with, with humans. How, uh, how, are you, how are you going about the research? So we are, actually we just finished this last week uh, preparing all the protocols. Uh, they have been reviewed thoroughly by our institutional review board, by, uh, by my mentors and the fellowship directors at Harvard. So we spend a little bit more than a year designing two sets of studies. And what we're gonna do with these two studies, one is it's a control uh, exposure study that we're going to see uh, we're going to measure first uh, in a in a small population of 120 volunteers. We're going to measure their exposure to adversity when they were children. Uh, we're going to we're going to actually screen around 500, and we're going to select the top 60 and the lowest 60 in terms of adversity in their childhood. And then we're going to see how they respond, how their immune system responds to stress, how it responds to air pollution, how it responds to bacterial infections, uh, and what we expect to see is that the participants that had higher childhood adversity when they were younger will respond, in fact, more aggressively. Uh, that's the first thing we really want to have evidence of. Behaviorally or, or no, when just you say aggressively? That's just their immune system. Their so what we're going to look at, yeah. it's biological markers of inflammation induced by stress or bacterial uh, exposures or air pollution exposures. Uh, and then at the same time, we're launching a prospective study, longitudinal study, uh, where we're gonna follow participants for several years uh, and we're gonna group them based on their childhood adversity. And what we hypothesize, what we expect to see is that the group with a high childhood adversity exposure they're gonna be more prone to developing inflammatory diseases like depression, coronary heart disease, and type two diabetes. So what are things, I mean, this, this sounds like uh, um, there are many people along the border and around the country that could be in, in, a, in a situation where their, uh, where their immune system might be compromised uh, due to their environment. Um, can you already, even though your, um, your research is in, in the process, um, are there things that people can be doing, um, either healthcare workers or social workers, that can help people avoid um, adverse effects of, of their environment? Definitely, again, you did mention, there's a lot of things that we already do know. Uh, and we do all know uh, that childhood adversity, although we don't understand how, which is what I'm studying, we do know there's good evidence that shows that adversity during childhood does predispose you or puts you at a higher risk of developing chronic illnesses. That, that I'll trust. So what we can do immediately, for instance, I'm a parent, is, is, is in, ensure that our parenting style uh, does not induce stress in our kids. Uh, we should be very wary of how our kids are exposed to adversity, right? Meaning the things that sometimes we're exposed to our kids, even sometimes by accident, it's something to be concerned, meaning which neighborhood are we living in. Uh, again, sometimes we cannot choose where we live in, but we can definitely do take an extra step to protect our kids from being exposed to a lot of things that might be around them. What are some, them. Um, some 
uh, some places to to avoid. Obviously, you mentioned places like the interstate and the. Uh, well, in I terms mean, well, in terms of air pollution, definitely, which would be one of the factors you should be considered. I mean, you want to uh, avoid spending too much time in traffic. I mean, maybe. Mm, starting your commute earlier in the mornings to avoid rush hour, things like that. But also nutrition is very important, meaning there's a lot of inflammatory foods that we, that we tend to eat. Uh, so for instance, le eating healthy, uh, me, I'm not a nutritionist, but I think it's, it's very well known, salads and anti-inflammatory or antioxidant foods, berries, mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. they cannot hurt. Uh, I mean, things that would, that would uh, put our body in the best conditions to um, support uh, not only air pollution, but any other stressor that our body can be exposed to, it just makes sense to do. All right, so um, we're almost out of time, but I want, uh, we probably will need to have a part two and, uh, and hear what, your, what, what the next step is. But um, so if you could wrap up and tell us what, uh, what, what you're looking forward to doing um, next and what you hope to find out. Well, uh, I think the next thing is to launch these studies, but I also want to mention that as we're launching this, uh, we are moving forward and we're working with the community already. Uh, we were working with youth uh, in the housing communities in El Paso, and we're making them aware of these susceptibilities. We're making them aware of the cycles of poverty, and we're helping them develop skills to get out of that. So we don't have to wait, and even me as a researcher, I know, I don't have to wait for every scientific detail to be defined for me to act. And I can do that as a scientist, and we can do that as parents, and we can do that as a community. Very good. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, pleasure, this Monica. Has been, thank uh, you for having Hector me. Hector Olvera. Uh, he's the director of research at the School of Nursing at the University of Texas at El Paso. I'm Monica Ortiz Uribe, and this has been Fronteras at Changing America.